Jan. I don't know if you if you want to record. Oh, she's recording. Perfect. Still recording. Yeah. Okay. 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 All righty, so I think we are about ready to start. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Rosa and this is Adriana. Um, so we'll be, we'll be your presenters for today. Um, this is the third in our series of uh, you know, presentations focused on older adults. And today's topic is on scams and some of, some of the more common scams and you know some of the reasoning behind how they happen, why certain people might be quote unquote targeted for these. Um, so that's what we're gonna be talking about. Uh, so both Adriana and I are students in the, master students in the clinical mental health counseling program at NAU. Um, that's, I guess, a little background about us. Uh, so I think we're, we're ready to move on here. Awesome. So why are older adults the ones to get targeted when it comes to STEM? That is for three reasons that we found upon your research. And the three of them are memory loss, some potential loneliness that individuals may be experiencing, and then the more trusting that there is during those times. Um, so just to, for me to jump in and go a little bit more in depth about them, I'll go in more in depth in the next few slides. All right, so in terms of memory loss, so as we start to age in the normal aging process, once we start reaching our 60s, it's when it becomes more noticeable when our memory starts to slowly fade away. So our information processing system starts to slow down. And when our information system starts to slow down, whenever we come across like the picture to your right, as you can see, when we come across those pictures, it's a lot easier for us to be able to fall for what it says because our processing is a lot slower than usual and we're more likely to click on things before really thinking it through. And then individuals who are experiencing earlier memory loss, that impacts their ability to judge or reason, reason their ability or even in decision-making uh, skills, it all becomes poor. So taking it back to the picture I have to the right, if you come across that, it's a lot more easier for an individual to not really have the best judgment or reasoning of why, why should I not click on this because it's free money. And in those moments, it's easy to make the decision of clicking on it and falling for it and accidentally giving away some of your and many scams with fake lottery state you have to act now. And just like in the picture on the right, because we don't have that patience and we don't give ourselves enough time to process everything, the likelihood of us clicking on it is very high. And when we find ourselves seeing these repetitive false statements in multiple emails, comments such as you forgot to pay me, or we agreed on this price, once an individual sees this multiple times, they, they may develop this habit of writing things down and providing the information to these emails that are not even real and they're just false, it's a scam. In terms of loneliness, research does show that feeling undervalued or lonely does tend to increase your likelihood of falling for scams by 30%. And the reasons for that is because when we fall under these states of mind of feeling lonely and uh, feeling like we don't really have this status in society and those needs are not being met. And some of those statuses in society can mean like, maybe you're not at the socioeconomic status class that you wanted to be in, or maybe the roles that you currently have in your life 
you're not content with. Maybe you feel like you're not being a great grandparent. Maybe you feel like you're not being a great brother or sister or sibling or friend, or you're just not feeling appreciated by society in any way. Those simple things can make an individual feel isolated. And when those needs are not being met, a lot of scams can provide that emotional support by saying something along the lines of, hey, like we're here to support you if you provide us X, Y, and Z. And in those moments where we're vulnerable, it's a lot easier to give in to those things. And even to add on, if you're ever at the store and you experience any thoughtless remarks by even customers or even like on top of that, another layer, you get to the uh, checkout and you come across a rude cashier, those interactions in itself can create some sense of feeling unnoticed or unappreciated. And when those emotions start to um, acclimate and can accumulate and consume you, those are the moments where you're the most vulnerable to fall into these things. In terms of more trusting, it is true that older adults are better than younger adults in detecting lies. However, according to research, older adults tend to be either more religious or patriotic and scammers can use these two specific traits as a form of exploitation. In terms of patriotism, that can open the door to scammers who pretend to be from a government agency or any kind of veteran group and they can ask for money for a certain cause that's not a real cause per se, or even for you to donate to a politician that may not even be a real politician. And in terms of the religious uh, route, some of the things that they can do is when you're religious, they can develop some fake parodies for you to contribute to, like I think of Blackstaff. And one of the places that does take parodies and I believe also dinner is there's it's a woman it's a woman's like shelter that for women that have been abused um and experienced domestic violence I don't remember the name of the place um if you ever get an email regarding charities for them, that obviously would be real, but there is individuals that can, and it is also religious, I believe it's a Christian group, um, but individuals can uh, send you emails of charities to donate to, for specific causes and they're not realistic, it's not a real group, and it can be easy to fall for it because if you do practice your religion and you believe in giving to other people and feeding the homeless, et cetera, it can be a lot more easier for you to fall into that. And going back on the patriotism, if politicians and politics and all of that is something that you've been interested in, something that you do in your downtime, like you're in the newspaper and kind of staying up to date on what's going on, when these scams of things come up and you're very into that, and that's a habit that you've developed, it can be very easy to fall into it when you yourself find yourself very passionate about either or of these do you have any questions or comments about um, any of the three kind of general uh, maybe topics that would contribute contribute to a person being more likely and you know to fall for a, a scam we welcome any questions I'd like to add, excuse me i'd like to add one thing uh, a few years back <clears throat> i'm ashamed to say that I got hooked into a free gift, quote unquote. Uh, I did something as, as innocent as I was trying to book a shuttle, an airport shuttle ride. And after I booked that ride with a, I think a re reputable company that I've heard of in the Phoenix area for a long time, uh, I got a thing that I had one of three gifts to choose. And I foolishly chose one and got the gift. And then I found out a few weeks later that I had signed up to get a gift, again in quotes, every month that would be $100 a month. And they would be taking it out of my credit card that I gave them for the shuttle. Mm -hmm. 
And I thought that was really a slick operation, but I was not happy with it. And uh, after some extended time with my credit card company and the bank, uh, I managed to wiggle out of it and did not have to pay even the first month. But since then, if anybody offers me a free gift, even if it's a new Camaro or something, <laughs> I, I just automatically say no, because I think it's very dangerous to accept anything like that. Because you get hooked into something you don't want to be in. There but are no that. free kittens in the world. No, <laughs> that's true. No, no free kittens. No free kittens. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, and Diane, I think you bring up the, that important piece, right, of this is this really fun thing and like nice thing. Oh, I get a, a gift. And there's a connection yeah. between something you did that was like pretty legit of, you know, uh, booking a shuttle. And then there's that second piece with the the small text, right? That we, we do not read the small text, I, I guess. Um, or yeah, I it was guess. a shady operation, like you said, of, well, that was a scam, 100% there. Right. But the important part though, is that you picked up on it and you took like the next step which I think are some, maybe some of the harder ones. I was lucky that I didn't have to pay any of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I also canceled the shuttle and I haven't called them again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I can understand that for sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that must've been frustrating for you. Yeah, it was. So thank you for sharing that with us, Diane. We appreciate that yeah. like firsthand experience. Yeah. All right, so now we'll move on um, to just some of the more, more common scams that could be targeting uh, older adults and older individuals. Um, and we'll run, we'll run through them and have some examples um, just to make it a little more concrete here. So the first one uh, would be like a general internet scam. So that could include like um, emails and uh, you know, pop-ups on your on your computer, that kind of thing, or you know, something similar to what you were sharing, Diana. Of like, you book the shuttle, then you get like this follow-up for something else. Um, so it's just a general like email, uh, or I'm sorry, internet-based scam. Um, you know, downloading a fake antivirus software is a is a pretty pretty common one. And then the, another one is a romance scam. Uh, that could be like via social media or dating websites. Um, so for the romance scam is essentially, you know, somebody is, I think if we're thinking of the three things, it would be maybe targeting like the more trusting and maybe potentially a little bit of the loneliness um, of, you know, that a person might be experiencing. Uh, and then they like swindle people out of a lot of money. Um, I actually work at a bank, um, so we do see a lot of romance scams of, you know, individuals coming in to, like, wire money to people and things like that. Uh, so, un unfortunately, I do have some experience with, with seeing that happen a bit. Um, so, I guess I just wanted to give a quick little tip on, specifically with email, I don't know. I know I myself received at least, like, three scam emails per day. Um, so I wanted to share a little tip that I, something that I personally use um, when getting an email that could come from like a very, it could have the name of a very trusted, you know, and common organization. Like maybe it's, you know, Chase or, or Wells Fargo or Amazon or something like that, that we could potentially be, you know, involved with. So I've got this little video here. Are you guys able to see the video there? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, the email there is the, the from is from the, looks like support, you know, JP Morgan Chase. Um, the email itself, it's a little bit blurry. Um, but if we look at the general, uh, you know, layout, it looks pretty, pretty legit, I would say, right? Like the Chase logo, the spelling is generally okay. There's some weird capitalization things, which is a little bit of a red flag um, and there's that link as well um, so we generally don't want to click on on links uh, on emails that or you know websites that are a little potentially sketchy um, and with 
things like banks and Amazon and everything, they're always like, we need to confirm your information because uh, apparently they don't have the correct information. So that is like one of the first warning signs. So what I do is I will actually click on the name of the sender. So without clicking on anything on the email itself, I click on the name of the sender and then that'll show you like the email itself, right? And then, I mean, that from something, something living insurance.co.uk. So that is, you know, a clear indicator that it is not actually from, from like Chase. Um, so that's a little trick that I personally use um, just to make sure, you know, like verify the sender. So clicking on that name of the sender, that'll then show you like the next screen and what the actual email address itself is, not the name that they're sharing with you. Um, did, did, did I explain that correctly? I'm sorry, I know I talked a lot there. Yeah, I'd never heard of that before. Yeah. I thought you were supposed to click on anything, you know, that you didn't recognize or, or didn't ask for. Right, yeah, and, and that's the thing, that's what I'm saying with like, for example, I'll receive a lot of like Amazon, um, like fake emails, but like you never know, right? Because it says like Amazon in the center. So then I never click on anything within the email, any links or anything like that, but that is just like within my phone or, you know, in this, if you're using your computer, you just click on the top portion here where it says from. So that's, mm -hmm. that's not a link within the email, that's just from, basic information. So we hit on that from, and then that shows you kind of the information of who sent it, um, from what specific email address. Is so there any little... way to report those types of emails? Because I get the Amazon ones all the time. Yeah, yeah. So what's recommended is that you, within your phone or you know your email, just mark that as, as spam or trash. So that your like uh, your browser or whatever email uh, provider you use can rec recognize for future that oh this is not this is just spam this is just trash email um, we do have some resources later later in the in the presentation of you know potential places where you can report um, you know if it's a, a actual like full on scam somebody calls you or things like that so um, thank you Deb that's a good question and I, I, we do touch on that right. Okay, so here's the next one. Big one is that of sweepstakes and lotteries, right? So that one's a exciting one. If we either get contacted via phone or email or mail um, and we want something, uh, something that we never even, uh, you know, enrolled in or tried to win. Um, but as you can see there in 2020, the uh, FTC reported that there was a loss of $166 uh, million uh, just involving scams of, of prices, sweepstakes, and lotteries. So that is a, a law, large, large amount of money. Um, yep. So here, what happens is generally, you know, you'll be contacted or, you know, a person will be contacted via mail or phone. If you're told that you want a prize, congratulations. There's this like heightened uh, excitement. Um, so if you receive it by mail, this letter says you want the prize, but you must pay a fee or a tax on it, right? Because you, you want something, so you got to pay a little, a little, little something on it. And they'll actually send a fake check that could look very real. Um, you're like, here's your money already. Um, all you have to do is deposit the check and just send us back, uh, you know, two thousand dollars or whatever that will cover the fees or the taxes, um, and then you get to keep the rest, right? So you're like, okay, that's not such a terrible deal. Um, so while the check is, you know, being processed, you send the money, you wire it. Once once the money is wired, you can't really retrieve it, um, and then eventually the check doesn't clear. So that's kind of how it happens. You get this really official looking check. Uh, one deposits it to their account, you wire the money for like their cut essentially uh, for the taxes or the fees. Um, then the check bounces and we're out, 
you know, $2,000 or whatever, whatever that may be. Um, I mean, I think these are pretty, one of like the longer, more common ones that we've seen, um, especially because, you know, they're mostly conducted via physical mail because uh, that's how you get the actual check itself. Um, so that is the one for, for the suit six and lotteries, right? And if we're looking um, online, there's that one of like, congratulations, you want like this gift card. And you just, there's one of those links that we don't, we don't want to hit on because if it's too, it seems too good to be true. It probably is, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, so that would be the sweepstakes and the lotteries. Any questions about or comments with this one? Does it really do any good to report these things? Does anybody pay any attention to our reports? Do you know? Yeah, yeah. I know when, when I was doing some research, um, I actually went to a lot of, of like federal websites um, and that's kind of where they, they keep track of how common these things are. And also I wouldn't be able to tell you, you know, they, they stop the scammers. I, I did not look too much into that, uh, but there is some, if anything, for data, data collection, and kind of also the preventive, uh, preventive aspect of it, of you being like, here's my experience, here's what they told me. So that helps like uh, individuals kind of get a better understanding of what's the trend right now. What are, what are scammers doing and how are they doing that and how do we prevent that? I will add on that a lot of the resources I looked into, it looks like they have a lot of prevention, different points of what you can do to prevent them. But once they've been, at, if you like accidentally acted on one of the scams and you lost the money, there is victim support and there is a process that you do go through. But most of the sources just have a list of things to prevent yourself from falling into. All right, so the next common scam is telephones. And when it comes to telephones, most of the time, again, just kind of going back to the religious aspect, um, an individual can pose as a fake charity. And if you're an individual that tends to have a passion to donate to you know, charities because you just enjoy helping other people and that's just, a hobby that you've created within your own life and something that you have set aside in your budget. Um, usually, I would say this happens mostly through email. Um, it can happen through the phone as well. Um, and they just call you asking for money saying, oh, hey, like we're making this charity for this group of you know homeless individuals or something that I've noticed recently that has been coming up. Um, if you guys are aware, there's been a larger amount of uh, children migrating from Central America to the U.S. at the border, and there's scammers here that are acting as if you donate some money, you're going to help these kids be released, either return back to their country or for them to seek asylum here in the U.S., and they need the money in order for that or just help them with the process if there is a road to residency or citizenship. And that's one of the ways in which scammers have recently uh, been getting money from elderly adults. And again, it's kind of, again, really attacking your emotions. And, you know, when you think of these kids, I'm sure a lot of emotions come up for you of like, yeah, like, you know, they need my help. I, I would love to contribute in any way. And that's kind of how they get you. Once you're vulnerable, it's easy to give in. And the other one is, is an individual calling asking as if there's some kind of cousin or a sibling that you have and informing you, hey, just want to let you know that, you know, someone is sick and they're at the hospital and we need money to be able to pay for their treatment. We're out of money. Can you please send like $200 check or something to help us contribute because we don't want this individual to die. Um, and I have a video on the right that can from the IRS that provides an example of what that may look like when it's 
for an IRS individual kind of um, acting as if they were for the IRS. Can you guys hear it? I don't hear any. No. Okay. Let me know if you can hear it. Marta, this are pretend. It's all garbled. Pretending to be IRS officials to get your money. They'll call, email, text you, claiming you owe back taxes, or there's a there it goes. Nope. <laughs> Okay, there it goes. I'll be back in just a moment. No, so <laughs> it worked for a minute. It worked for a minute. Or there's a problem with your tax return. They even rig caller ID to make their call look official. They play on your fears. They threaten to. you claim and you owe back tax scam art yeah no sort of comes and goes Chris are pretending to be IRS officials to get your money they'll call email or text everybody you, claiming you owe back you know, taxes there's a problem with your here. tax return they even rig caller ID to tax. make their call look official Play it. <laughs> Play it. Scam artists are pretending to be IRS officials to get your money. They'll call, email, or text you, claiming you owe back taxes, or there's a problem with your tax return. D to make the call look official. Okay, I think we might have to just skip this. It's Bob give you the gist of it. I think it's the internet here at the gym is little. Yeah. <laughs> Sunk by the internet. Yeah. Victims of technology. All right, well, let's go back to the, the present. Oh, yeah. But the IRS can contact you by mail, don't they? If they want you, they don't call you up or email you, I don't think. I think they just come to your house. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and that's the first born child. I don't know if that somebody called. <laughs> that's step two. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but it's all mail. I, I'm glad you all mentioned that because as an IRS person, um, and you know, essentially that's how they could get like your social security number or something like that. You get you to send wire some money if, if it's like your taxes were wrong, um, et cetera, et cetera. So sounds like you all pretty, pretty aware with that one with at least with the IRS, they will not call you. They'll just take your first newborn and uh, send you a, a letter in the mail. <laughs> I hope you guys can see our internet connection. Um, but one last thing I do want to share is sometimes you may receive calls with numbers with the area codes of 876 
or 809 or 284. And most of the time when you get calls from those numbers, it's to confirm that you've won a prize. And when you don't answer, they tend to leave you a voicemail and tell you to call them back to confirm that prize. However, I want to inform you to please not give them a call back because those numbers are from Caribbean countries and they're known for the hotbeds for where most of the frauds have occurred and other phone scams. So I'll repeat the area codes again. It's 876 and 809 and 284. These numbers usually belong to places like Jamaica or the Dominican Republic or the British Virgin Islands. And again, they're mostly posing as if you've won a prize and they expect you to give them a call back. And those are one of the main things I saw in the Department of Justice, that it's very, very common for individuals to fall for these and give a call back. That's good to know. Did for a long time they come from Nigeria? Scam calls came flooded from Nigeria, yes. maybe they were for a while. Yes, they moved, they moved around. They moved to the Caribbean. Yeah. Yes. The weather was nicer. Yeah. <laughs> Better work environment for them there. <laughs> yeah. OK. So here's another Scam one that's uh, are pretending very, uh, more specific to uh, an older adult who might have grandchildren. So essentially what happens here is that big, big play on, on emotions, right? Um, and there's that sense of urgency. You know, somebody calls you and they say, and generally this is how, how it happens. They'll say like, hey, grandma, grandpa, do you know who this is? And then the person would be like, Oh, is that you, Jimmy? And then that's kind of where they play it off. And they're like, oh, yes. And I'm like, it's Jimmy. I am so sorry. Like, I'm in, I'm in an emergency. I'm, you know, I'm in jail for, for this or that. Or I got hurt and I'm at the hospital. Um, and it's this, like, real sense of urgency of, like, can you please send money, like, right away? Like, I really need your help. Like, don't, don't tell anybody. I'm just embarrassed. Uh, so if you can just really help me right now, uh, this so like the super played on on that emotion and urgency, um, which if we recall from the beginning of the presentation, you know, like we need that time to process and be like, okay, like take a step back, take a breath and, and see what's, what's really going on. Um, so essentially that's how, how, you know, the grandparent scam would work. Um, of somebody being like, hey, do you know who this is? We give a name. They're like, yeah, that's exactly who it is. Um, you know, I am your grandchild, Jimmy. Um, and like, please help me. But don't tell my parents because I'm embarrassed. Uh, my so my like sister that. had one of those. And they claimed to be her brother, which we have seven kids in the family. So mm -hmm. she filled in the name of our brother. And then it went round and round and... He needed bail money and all this. He somehow ended up in Las Vegas. <laughs> exactly. And luckily, my, my brother, my my brother-in-law called my brother on another phone and said, are you in Las Vegas? <laughs> they were not. <laughs> no. <laughs> He's like, no, I'm still home. Why? <laughs> Yeah, and that's a, that's a really good. I got an email from a friend, supposedly from a friend one time, who, who said that he, he was uh, had gotten his wallet stolen and all his credit cards, you know, and he was in another town and, and needed help to get home. You know, I'm embarrassed to ask, but I don't know who to ask. And it sounded so real. I mean, it just, but I too called first to see. <laughs> And he was home safely with his wife. He wasn't anywhere. Yeah, see, so it, it really happens. And I mean, you both just shared some like pretty direct experiences with that. Um, and you both shared one of the best prevention measures, which is like, don't give in to that immediacy and just take a step back and call, you know, like check in with that person. Like, hey, like, are they okay? Or hey, are you okay? 
And then yeah, you can always say, give me your number and I'll call you back. <laughs> After I you call are very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and I do want to acknowledge that it, it is hard in the moment you know because in that moment your heart's racing you're experiencing a lot of these physical sensations of worry and concern and it takes a lot to be able to really take that step back especially if you have support like you mentioned Deb you had someone call and I'm sure in that moment you were freaking out but you had someone to support you to verify if it was true yeah all right. We'll give it a try, see if this one plays. If not, we'll just keep going. Hello. Good morning. You this is Sanderson. It? You might not know this, but Medicare fraud occurs every. Oh, is this the wrong one? <laughs> oh. Granddad, it's me. I an accident in Mexico. I I'm in jail. Jimmy, is that you? Yeah, it's Jimmy. I need money for bail right now. In jail? You need to send money right now. Please don't tell anyone. Scammers are tricky and can pretend to be anybody in any situation. They seem like the real deal. They play on your fears. The goal? To get you to act fast. Check out if they really are who they say they are, even if they sound like a loved one. Heard from an imposter? Report it at ftc.com. Yeah, so that essentially played out as you all recommended of checking checking in with somebody. Um, and that kind of clarified any any potential doubts or, you know, intention to act. All right, so now on to Medicare. So in terms of Medicare, this can be you know, through an email, but most of the time it is through phone call. You receive a call, and one of the very common things that they ask is to verify any benefits or a claim. Um, and in those moments when they call you, they say that yeah. they're going to gift you or give you a free offer if you verify whatever claim it is that, you know, occurred, whether you went to the doctor or a hospital recently. Um, so one of the tips I can give you is in those moments when they ask you to verify, um, don't not give them any of your information because what they usually want to get is that Medicare identification number. And with that number, once it's given to them, that's when they can bill for any form of fraudulent services and pocket the money. And some of those examples of fraudulent services that they can bill for is billing for services or supplies that were never even provided or even mis mispresenting a diagnosis, beneficiaries, identity, or the service provided or other facts just to justify the payment. Um, so again, these will be usually through the phone and it's just asking for a verification of a specific claim or visit that you made to the doctor. So when they do ask for these things, I think on your end, in order to challenge the caller is ask them, well, when is it when I went to the doctor? And as they throw out dates in that moment, you think about, well, I never went to the doctor in like the past few months or weeks. And that's how you know that it's not real. And because right now we're in COVID, we're still in the COVID season, one of the things that I saw that has been coming up a lot is a lot of scammers have been trying to really tune into the elderly adults by calling them and or emailing them too and offering them COVID items, which can be either test kits or masks. And they're asking you in those moments to provide them with your Medicare identification number in order for you to receive some of those items. However, it's not real. They're just individuals trying to get your number again to be able to use your Medicare number to be able to bill you for services that were never even provided to you. And on the video to my right, hopefully it works, it's going to show a woman who got a call uh, from a Medicare scammer, and you will see how she handled the call and did not fall for the scam given. 
Hello? Good morning, Mrs. Sanderson. You might not know this, but Medicare fraud occurs every day. This is Mike, the business manager from your doctor's office. There seems to be an error in our records. Can I get you to just verify your Medicare number for me? It costs billions of dollars and catches thousands of recipients off guard every year. Well, I just got off the treadmill. Can I give you a call back in a few minutes? Of course. Let me give you the number for my direct line so you can bypass the receptionist. Perfect. Don't be another statistic. Contact the Senior Medicare Patrol today to learn how to prevent, detect, and report Medicare fraud. Hi, I'd like to report a suspicious call. All right, so as you can see, the lady, she got a call, and instead of her giving in in the moment, she did ask if she could give him a call back. And she was, she said she was working out, which was a great, I guess, way to deceive the caller, even though she wasn't really on the treadmill. But she managed to take a step back just to process the call and not give in to it. And in the same way, that's something that I would like to give you guys a tip on in those moments where you get calls, just to be able to take those few minutes or seconds to take a step back, take a deep breath, and really think about if this is actually real or not. And as you can see, the lady, after she hung up, she noticed that it wasn't something that she had gotten services for in the past. So that's why she made the next step in reporting it. And as you can see the number on the screen, that actually is a real number. And I believe that's one of the resources I have. So that is something that you can do right after you notice that it is an actual individual trying to scam not just you, but probably a hundred or thousands of other individuals. Do you guys have any questions in regard to Medicare scam? I appreciate having those weights to report these things. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. A lot of times you don't know what what to do, and then you don't do anything that doesn't help anything. All right, so then here are just some general, uh, you know, prevention tips or maybe tips for in the moment. Um, definitely, it, the first one would be I feel like we've highlighted this a lot, but you know, resisting the urge to act immediately, like no matter how dramatic the story may be. Um, like Adriana was just saying, like taking that step back, taking a breath, and then going from there. Um, and I probably that is a good tip in life in general, right? Of just taking a step back and taking a breath, taking it uh, just a, a notch down and a little bit slower. Um, so not not giving into that sense of urgency. Um, the third one would be, if possible, verify the caller's identity. So for example, if it's one of those, uh, you know, family member scams or a grandparent scam. Um, you know, asking some things that like only only the person would know, right? Um, and then at that point, also taking the next step to you know check in with the person directly or with somebody who would know, like like you all were sharing, right? Like calling the you know somebody's partner, or their their parent, their son, anything like that. Um, big one is you know not taking cash, gift cards, or money transfers. Um, you know, like a wire, you know, whether that's like a money gram or a Western Union wire, anything like that. Because once the money is sent, you, there's really no way to retrieve it. Um, I mean, you'd, you'd have to kind of go through a, another process, kind of similar to what you were saying, Diane, with like your bank, trying to help have them help you. Um, but, you know, directly, there would be really no way of, of getting that money back. Um, number five would be get that second opinion, right? Get a second second pair of eyes on the email or get, um, I guess second opinion could be, you know, checking in with somebody else to make sure that your family member is okay. So bringing in something, somebody else uh, to just, you know, ha yeah, have that support and uh, have them give you their opinion of like, oh, that seems eh, iffy. Two brains are probably better than one in some cases. Uh, and then the last one is, if it seems too good to be true, like some of those, uh, you know, sweepstakes or lottery winnings, et cetera, it, it probably is too good to be true. Um, maybe that's just general general rule for, for when it comes to scams. Um, yeah, so these are just some general uh, 
tips for, for prevention and maybe some action uh, that we found kind of that could apply to different kinds of scams uh, that we we presented today or, you know, some that we might not have touched on. So I wanted to share that with you all. And I do want to add on one more piece if you notice. Most of the scams, including like the lottery ones, most of the time they use fear tactics to make sure that your central nervous system is activated. And in those moments when your central nervous is activated, it's very difficult to think rationally because your emotion part of the brain is what has taken over and can be on overdrive because you're full of very concern. So just being aware that most of their their tactics are fear-based and knowing that it's important to have at least another individual to support this so you can be able to ground yourself as the supporter is, you know, assisting you. This has been very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, we have a, not necessarily a quiz, but a little activity. Um, if you are willing just to, you know, you get this call, they say this, I wonder, what do you notice any red flags? How would you react to this? So you get a call from this number, and they say your total income for your tax form is incorrect. Please provide me with your social security number to fix it, um, or else you will be charged. I think I'd hang up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The IRS doesn't call you. Oh, exactly. Yeah. So that's a big red flag. And here, the tricky thing I would say is that it's like a 928 number. So you're like, oh, maybe that's like flags that IRS, but it is like you're saying that they will not call you. We've, we've made that, you know, we've all pretty much agreed on that. Um, and, you know, social security number. That, you know, nobody nobody needs your social security number <laughs> over the phone. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if this is true or not, but something else I've heard is that some people, some scammers will say, can you hear me? And if you answer in the affirmative, mm -hmm. then they can use mm -hmm. that yes for something else, like you agreed to the free car or whatever it was, you know? I don't know if that's true or not. Maybe it might, might be an old wives tale, but I've heard of that too. <laughs> We're all old wives. That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or former wives. <laughs> whatever. Oh. Yeah, they're sneaky, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've also heard of that, Diane. Actually, um, yeah. I, I can't really tell you right now if, if that is, uh, one of the tactics that they use or something that, that is, you know, kind of based on facts. But I've definitely yeah. heard of that. And I, I will be honest with you all. Whenever I get a call from a number that I don't know, I don't always answer with like, yes or hello. I'll be like, uh huh, <laughs> you know, or something like that, just because of that. But anyway, that's just, that's a, another story of I've heard, I've heard that anything. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Sometimes I'll just like answer, but I won't say anything. See if they say anything. That's a good point to answer. Ah, okay, so we have the second one. You get an email from this email address. It says, "Click here, to claim your price now." What are some of the red flags? <laughs> You didn't enter the darn thing in the first place. You didn't place. enter it to enter the lottery. <laughs> exactly. Did not enter the lottery. What else do we see? Urgency. That yeah. It's got yeah. urgency. Everything's in capital letters. Like, oh, do it right now. <laughs> exactly. Oh. Did not enter the lottery. We'd say whatever, maybe. There's a lot of sense of urgency. And then there's that a link as well. Right? We're like, oh, we know not to click on those links. <laughs> so yeah, awesome. Right. All right. So you get a call from this number, 876-123-000. And they say, hey, how are you? Remember me? I'm your cousin Pablo from California. I need money. My son is fighting cancer and we can no longer afford his medical treatment. Can you send us $500 to help? I don't want him to die, please. 
What are some red flags in this phone call? 876. 876. <laughs> yes. Ding, ding, ding. Great job. <laughs> He's in the Caribbean. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's not in California. <laughs> That's true. And the playing on your emotions, the crying and that desperation and everything. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, the number, the emotions, that sense of urgency of like, I don't want him to die. Like, we need the money. We're no longer going to be able to receive treatment. Yeah, that's how they get you. Plus, $500 is not a lot to ask for. Yeah. Oh, in an yeah, app. that's a good point. You know, it's for, like, for say, well, if you were asking for $2,000, click, but $500 to help somebody with cancer, like anybody could probably come up with that amount of money. Yeah, so you're right. not an outrageous ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a great point you did bring up because medical bills are way more than that. Triple, <laughs> yeah. quadruple that. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Where's the picture going? Oh, there it is. <laughs> All right, so here I have provided links of resources. I would love to share them in the chat or if you guys can share your emails, I can send you the, the links to them. Okay. The very first link is uh, a source that provides you with a different method of prevention to make sure that you do not fall for those scams. And then the second link is a resource for you to use if you have, you know, you are a victim of, or anybody you know is a victim of any form of scam of the ones we talked about. There's of course multiple different scams. The ones we touched on and highlighted were the most common ones. And then the last one, the Department of Justice, that in itself kind of puts all of these sources together. That one not only has like victim support, and prevention, but it also has guidelines and steps on how to report them. I can put them on the link. I'll figure out how to do this. Or if you guys can put your emails on the chat if you want some of these links, because these are links. Um, great for you guys to have just in case it comes up, because most often than not, these things do come up. So who do I, do I want to send it to the email to Brian Schmitz? Um, if you, yeah, it's, it's hard. oh yeah. yeah, yeah, drop it in the chat box. Yeah. Be great. Please. This has been very informative. I've enjoyed this. Yeah, we, we appreciate all of, you, all of your feedback and your sharing of your experience for both of you. Yeah, so if, if there, you know, we're about to wrap up, um, but we wanted to open it up. If there were any other comments, uh, questions or anything like that um, before, we, before we let you all go. No, it was great. Thank you for putting it together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and this and this will be, well, so we'll be recorded. So I, I know Brian will put it. I, I don't get like the YouTube uh, page or something. So you can okay. access it again if you want to see it or share with somebody. Um, share with somebody. And, yeah, exactly. So um, Deb, we got your email. So we'll, we'll send you the link. Um, okay. It'll be from an NAU email. So all right. <laughs> the, the trusty one. <laughs> the trusty one I trust. Yeah, right. it was nice to see you all. Bye. Have Bye. a good day. Bye. Bye. All right.